use a graphical interface. So I'm going to use a tool called Nano. So Nano is a text editor that we use it in the terminal itself. This is the kind of interface you get whenever you type Nano and type the name of the file that you want to edit. So if I type here, test.txt, it opens up the Nano interface. I like to um, specify some stuff here, like, hold on. All right. On the very top, here is the name of the file, right? This is the name of the tool. Right below are the functions. These are the functions. For example, see this this symbol is actually called a carrot. Not the vegetable kind of, but a different kind of carrot, right? Uh, but it represents the control key, all right? So if it's written carrot x, this means control plus x. If it's written carrot um, g, it's control plus g. Got it? So these are all the functions. So they are like keyboard shortcuts that are mentioned here. So for example, if you want to exit from Notepad, you do control x. So if I do control X, see what happens. Control X and it's gone, right? It got back me back to the simple terminal interface. That's how it is. So I can simply type anything in here, by the way. <clears throat> this, oh, for example, if I type, this is some random stuff. I am... Akash Sharma. Hello. What's up? Yeah. So um, now the navigation here will not read through your mouse. For example, when I'm using a graphical notepad like this one, if I want to edit something after directory, I can click in front of directory and I can continue my typing after that, right? Or if I want to edit something here, I click here and I continue. The, so the navigation is through the mouse. But in this case, the mouse is non-operational. That means all your navigation is going to be through your keyboard. I cannot click in front of the first line and then continue typing because, as you can see, my marker is still here in the third line. Right? So in order to go here, I literally have to use my arrow keys on the keyboard. These keys in order to go up, down, right, left. So if I want to go up, that's how I do it. Coming to the very end. And then I start typing. You see? So um, that's how the navigation is going to work. Additionally, if you see on the very top, right now, there is this asterisk that's mentioned. So this asterisk is actually a representation that your file is unsaved. So once you save it, it won't be there anymore. Simple, right? Once you save it, it's gone. So the stars means that there are some unsaved changes in your file. So in how do we save it? As you can see, there is a shortcut for that over here, control O. This is for writing out. Write out. Now, what does write out mean? Like when you are working with your memory, with your um, hard disk. So every time you're doing an operation, let's say you're transferring some photographs from your PC to your hard disk. So what you're doing is basically you're writing your data in your hard drive. That's what you do it. You are writing something in there. So basically, whenever you are using Nano in order to create a file, 
you are writing some stuff in your hard disk. So write out is actually it means the same as save as save as. So it's asking you to save the file that you're working with. So if I do control O while editing the file, you'll see what happens. When I do control O, it's asking me file name to write. It's asking me or just confirming with me, like, do you really want to keep this name or you want to edit? I can change it to whatever I want, but I'm going to keep it the same. When I press enter, see what happens. Done. And on the top, the asterisk is also gone, as I mentioned before. It's gone. That means the file is saved. The moment I make any more changes to this file, the asterisk come back. You see? It's there. If I remove the changes and I save it again, it's gone. The question is, once the file is saved, everything is done, hunky-dory, how do I really get out of it? Simple. Control X. You're out of it. You see, when I created the file, the timestamp said 551 for the creation of the file, right? But if I do LL again, you see the updated timestamp is the latest one, 557, because I made some changes in there. You see, so after the creation, it got updated and the last update was made at 557. That's the timestamp. Earlier, the file size was zero. Now the file size is 63 bytes. Right. So these are some information that are added additionally. OK. Um, yeah, so that's how you edit a file. But the question is, how would you see the content inside of a file? If you want to see a content inside of a directory, you simply go in the directory and do either ls or ll. You see the content of a directory. But if you want to see the content of a file, like this one, text.txt, um, you do not need to open always with Notepad because when I open Notepad, I... I am losing the access to this terminal window and it takes me to the notepad window, kind of like, right? There's a transition. But if I don't want really want to go in the file, and I just want to see the content quickly. There is a command for that called the cat. Cat will display the content of a file. So cat is short for concatenate. That's how you spell that. So cat is the command here, uh, which is used in order to see the content of a file. So when I do cat and I type a file name, let's say test.txt, see what happens. It doesn't open the file, but it does show me the content of the file here. You see? So I'm, and by the way, I'm still in my terminal. I'm still in the shell. I am not transitioning into any other interface whatsoever i can still just simply see the content without opening the file so that's kind of like a good functionality it provides so yeah that's the benefit of it sorry i have a question yes solomon yes not exactly on this um on this um the last one you did if uh, you know we can see the last modified date that's test.tst assuming you want to uh, get the history of that file. Maybe you are doing like a forensic analysis of this particular test file. When was it created? When last was it modified? Possibly if it has been modified like two or three times. Is mm. it possible that we get the history of all the modifications done on that particular file? Yep. Yep. You can. So there is a command for that. I was going to tell you that later, but it's okay if you're asking the question now. There's a command called um, stat. So for example, if I want to see like what kind of changes have been made to this file in particular with respect to its timestamp, I do stat test.txt. Stat is for status, by the way. So when I press enter, you can see here, um, it gives me the status information. When was it accessed? When it was modified? 
when it was born, what were, when was the changes made, all this information is here. Uh, these are the access and the permissions and privileges. I haven't taught this yet. I will explain it later on. Okay. Um, so all this information is in here. So yeah, stat is the command for that. Uh, I was going to teach this in, in, in the period when I was going to teach you about forensics a little bit. But yeah, okay. so. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So stat command is used to um, provide detailed information about a file, including the timestamps. So the output includes the access time, modify time, change time, as seen here. So yeah, all right. Okay, moving on. Yeah, so uh, one more thing. Um, yeah, okay, so things are going to get interesting here now. Take a look. We understood these two things. So this is the first part, if I say, um, hold on. Yeah, okay. So this section is the size. This section is a timestamp. This is the name. We keep this separate for now. Let's take a look at this one right now, okay? This section, what does it mean? It if, if, now, I'm sorry, Srinath. Uh, can you please mute yourself? I think you're looking something at the background. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Moving on. So um, this is what's written there. Dash R W dash R W dash R dash dash. So a quick and easy hack to identify the difference between a file and a directory. See, right now you have a color-based scheme, a schemata, a color scheme through which you can actually identify what's a file and a folder. You can see files are written like this, folders are written in blue. So you can easily under understand that directories are always gonna be in blue. But what if there is no color scheme, then how will you identify? So it's simple to identify a folder and a file, you can simply take a look at the very beginning. The D in the front is actually for the directory. So if there's a D in the front of this string, so for those who don't know, a string basically is a set of characters. A string is a set of characters. These characters could be alphanumeric, could be symbolic, could be anything. So a string is a set of characters, a sequence of characters, basically. So in this string, the D in the very front represents the directory, because you will see in front of test.txt, there is no D. That shows that it's not a directory. It's a file. So if it's not a D, if it's, it's a file, simple as that. So that can be one way of identifying in a case where you do not have uh, color schemes to identify separately. All right, but here you can see the D is empty. So we can literally leave this part because we know it shows if it's a file or a folder, right? So we can leave that part. But what about this part of that string? What is this? I'll explain you. So um, there are three kinds of permissions for a file. Right? This permissions goes as read, write and execute as seen as r w x that's what's mentioned here you see r w x read tells you if you can open the file if you can see the content write tells you if you can modify the file and execute tells you if you can run the file and operate on this file. So these are the three permissions that are given to a particular file based on um, who can operate it and uh, who have the privilege. But now the question might be arising, why is it like repeated multiple times? So in a, in a general scenario, in an ideal situation, this kind of permission matrix can be seen and it can be further divided into three parts if you'll see one two and three
so this division is actually given to um the owner the group and the others so let's say for this file in particular uh test.txt right let's consider that the owner of the file will have these permissions the group members of this owner you know this owner must be having a group so if the members are in that group they will have this, these permissions and all the others in the system they will have these permissions so let's say uh, i told you yesterday the difference between a user and a root right i told you the difference they're two different kind of accounts in linux a user account and a root account root is the owner nobody can be root root is root a user will always take permission from the root ultimately root can decide if user one and user two can have different permissions if user one is superior and user two is inferior root can decide that so consider like an architecture of a company you know let's say i run a call center and i got um the ceo on the top right and there goes two managers i'm gonna say man one and man two these managers also must be having some employees under them so let's say there are three employees each manager have a b c and x y z right so um consider this ceo have all the powers right he decides that these people must also be having powers but not as compared to the ceo of course this is the high privilege this is the medium privilege and there are the least privileged users right if ceo have a file okay let's say the file is um bingo.txt okay so this file is owned by the ceo managers only can read the file they cannot write the file they cannot execute the file okay maybe you know what managers managers can also read and write but they cannot execute it ceo have all the rights read and execute i mean he owns it of course but the employees the least privileged employees they don't have any rights but they can only read it nothing else they can only see the content of the file of the bingo but they cannot edit the file they cannot execute it they can see the content and that's pretty much they all can do so this way a hierarchy is maintained for the same file in an architecture so in a system the root can be the owner of the file he can make sure that who have what kind of privilege assigned to the file okay so for example if you see here in particular this is the information for the ownership every user by the way every user have its own group okay every user have a group so let's say if there are three users a b c a b c are a part of group of manager one right and x y z are a part of group of manager two manager one and manager two are a part of group of the ceo abc is not a part of the ceo group because if abc will be a part of the ceo group he will become man three manager three right but that's not the case so uh, a is not a part of the ceo group he is a part of manager one so he's limited with the privileges that manager one will be able to give 
So that's how privilege distribution works. So if someone is a part of the root group, he have the highest privilege among all the other users. But if a new user is created, so the privileges will be assigned accordingly, either by the high privilege user or by the administrator. See, the root is something we call as a super user. Super user, because he has superpowers, you know, he is a super user. So let's take the S from super and U from the user, okay? S, U. If as a normal user, you want to ask root to do something for you, how will you say that? You'll say, do it, right? Please do it. Do something for me, right? You'll ask me to do it something. So you say do. So D, O, sudo. This sudo command is actually super user do. So basically, when you are doing sudo, you are asking the root account to do something on your behalf. You are taking permission from the root account to execute a certain task. So let's say if a user do not have the high privilege to execute a certain kind of task, he can do sudo and then execute the command. So by typing sudo in front of a command, you're taking the permission from the root in order to execute it. I'm going to show you for um, instance, let's just go in a particular folder called var htl. Okay, now see the difference here. The owner for test.txt is Kali and it is uh, occupied by the Kali group, right? But here for this file, the owner is root and it's occupied by the group of root only, right? User, group. Username, group name, okay? That's how it is. The problem is if Kali, because you see I am right now Kali, if I try to access a file that is by root, that is owned by root, so I need to have the proper permissions for that, isn't it? For example, if you see, I can, um, the, the owner can read and write it, but the group members can only read it. If I am a group member, I can read it, the file, but I cannot write anything into it. So for example, to read the file, I will do, cat um, index.html. See, I can read it. It opens the content of the file, right? I can read the file. It doesn't say that I cannot do that. But if I try to do nano index.html, what does it say? You see, it is unwritable you cannot write into it. If I write something, it's not going to save it because it is unwritable. I don't have clearly the permissions to write inside it. So I'll exit. So that's the difference because I am not, I am a group member. I don't have the right permission. The W is missing. So how will I do that? If I want to edit the file, how will I do that? But if I do it with sudo, so why sudo, what I'm doing is as a user, I am asking the permission from the 